Dr. Saeed Khan is our next speaker, and he's going to go through that data and research. And for those that uh, maybe never heard of the potassium paradox, this will be another eye opener for you. So please welcome Dr. Saeed Khan. Thank you very much, Brad, Hug Brock, and uh, management of the agri agriculture bio. Uh, the topic for me to discuss today is potassium paradox. Uh, this project was started way back in the 80s when I came as a young chap. I am now retired from the University of Illinois. And uh, I started this because there was a problem with potassium throughout the world, not just here. The test was not stable. Okay, okay, thank you. So the test was not stable, it was not reproducible, it was jumping around, and when I came here, the problem I heard over there, I originally came from Pakistan. That was my bachelor degree and I want to pursue higher degree just to learn more about it and serve the citizen throughout the world, not just Pakistan, but here now. I'm stuck here serving you guys. So that was a problem and I got it. So I started this work in 80, 86. And they were bi-weekly sample from six plot. They has different fertility level at that time. Uh, on the farm, south farm of University of Illinois and Urbana Champaign. The soil was drummer and it was very tough to work with. It's called combo. <laughs> very tough, a lot of clay. And I start working on this test and it took me close five, five years before I completed my MS and PhD. And I was away from this country because my scholarship was supported by those farmers which in, in Pakistan that they sent me here to graduate. So I went there and I became head of the department and was serving there as a fertility specialist. And I opened nine labs over there for testing and also train people. Then I got involved, they, they go to in one administration and I came back as a, back to the University of Illinois and start working with Richard very closely in the lab. And for the last 25, 30 years, we were producing all these research that you are now discussing, we are discussing here. Now back to the data. So I generated this data for 20 years back, but nobody was willing to publish it. That was the problem. Because everything was going against their fertility recommendations, particularly nitrogen and potassium. They were not good for sale because it was science. And nobody was publishing my research or our research, which is coming out from the lab of Dr. Malveni, because the whole folks were against. They did not want to hear, because facing the truth and telling the truth, that's not easy. Yeah. There are consequences in every area. If it's a doctor or politician or scientist, they don't want to hear because money is involved. That was a problem, but Richard is a very firm guy. He stand on it and I was standing there. And finally, we were succeeded to publish this data in a, in a, another fund, another type of research journal, which was not science and society because they were our agronomy. The, the, the normal folks, they were not publishing it. Anyway, after publishing, people like it, like you guys who are the end user. So let me introduce my topic here. Potassium paradox, I will care, why I say paradox? Because it's a fraud. The potassium testing, fertility, they were not were supposed to be. It was just for sale. And the antique tables made daily, but it's, they call them antique. It's just, it's exactly reflect this topic. Let me explain a little bit about the potassium farm in the soil and how, which one is going toward the crops 
and how craft feeding him is a equilibrium between three pools. Just like we have nitrogen and phosphorus, in nitrogen phosphorus is a little bit different, rather very different from the potassium chemistry. We have three pools. This is soil 101, which I am explaining here now. These three pools are mineral K, and then clay fixed K, that's potassium, and then exchangeable potassium. Normally, when you take sample, six inches or seven inches, with the probe, we are testing for this one, which is a little part of this one, the total. That is two to three percent, either 200, 300, 100 to 400, depending on the soil type. We are testing for this on six inches. Now, the difference when I told you that is different from phosphorus and nitrogen. In nitrogen, you have organic carbon. That's the, the, the main storage, or organic matter, humus. Same is, and that humus contains phosphorus and nitrogen. Everything is there. But the problem and the chemistry is different because when you convert nitrogen from organic matter or humus to available, you need microbes. They have to digest it. You need pH. You need to have good environment required temperature. But, but it's not the case with, with potassium. Potassium is mineral and it can easily come here and become available, exchangeable with just water. You have water, you have potassium, just like you have on the village level, you have big tank of water. You go to your bathroom, open the tape, and you have a glass full of water. It doesn't mean it's finished, you can again. That's exactly the case here. This case come on and on, look these stuff, they can go back and forth very easily, very fast. And look to the amount of this. If this is Illinois, if you go to the south, you have 20,000 pounds per acre in six inches is potassium, available, just you need water. You don't need microbes here, in this case. You take water, they will come out and feed the plant. And if you put fertilizer or more K is in a farm residue, they will go back and save. It's like a, your saving account in the bank. They, there is no complication involved. As we are, is the, the system of changes for Nitrogen and phosphorus is more complicated than potassium. But in this country and throughout the world, before I start researching, they were saying that, oh no, they are the same, they, they, you cannot get this one. That's, that's hogwash. Chemistry and this all I read and took courses. This one is, you measure, but doesn't mean anything. You take exchange, and they are so dynamic that they can go, you go tomorrow, today, and they would be changing on an hourly basis. So it's not stable. And why it's not stable? It's soluble. So you have leaf, you have stems, you have residues, you have this heavy pool over there. If water come, they can come out. And that's the reason that in this research, I will later on show you the data. We research here in the North America, so many trials which were, which were done with the potassium chloride, response is not there. And I will show you. And this is very important because if you are putting anything, testing your soil and they are not reliable and you are not getting anything, it's not paying for yourself and you are putting all this money, that's a losing, losing proposition. Yeah. You are losing money for nothing. And on the top of that, I will also show you data that you will be hurting your crops and your health and destroying your soil. But you won't see it in the book. So take notes and I'm going through one by one. So when we are talking about potassium testing, we are talking about a very small portion, this one, exchangeable. They are on the surface of the clay. While clay, if you look in under the microscope, they have, this portion, which is like a sandwich inside the clay layer. But this is also available depending on the soil. When you heat it, you dry it, 
when the water is coming from the clay in the lab and you are drying testing for it, it dissolves the internal potassium and coming back. That's why you will see a huge difference between moist soil in the field and when you dry it, they would increase 100 fold. Instead of 200, you will get the test of 400 because it's coming out with the water when you are drying. So you get give money to the tester, but that means nothing. Okay, let's go back and see it, how this clear, the clay fixed potassium is available. I'm talking about this one. Next slide. Now I took, this was my, that fertility trial, which I was working. There were six trials, and I'm showing the data for a zero, zero check plant, which has never been fertilizer since 70. And they were taking corn and soybean from these. So it was like a depletion is going on. You were depleting the soil, not putting potassium. This was one of the plot. And I took that, that sample, which I took it in the uh, one of the day during those studies. And that dates were given 90, 86, 87, 88, and 89. So I took these samples and you can clearly see that the death, and I put the soil test first, the exchangeable one, which was the easy one, so I removed it. And they were close to 214 to 246 in different years. They were not going change, but they, they were increasing instead of decreasing. You see that? And there was no addition. So when I explain the equilibrium of these, I show you that from where it's coming. And I would also tell you the other bigger source of it too. So then I, what I did, did I went to the lab and take that one gram soil from each ear of that, this was six soil. And I removed first the exchangeable one, the outer one. And then I went and removed the internal in the clay layer. In 10 minutes, I use some acid and I remove it and keep that soil in the filter paper, I was not throwing it. The same soil. And I recover it and treat it again, and I get the, the second extraction. Within maybe 15 or 10 minutes, they were oozing out like a spring. And then I took another one, 413, and then it's increasing, and it stay here at 200 and 300. So by six extraction, I remove almost close to 2,500 pounds from one gram of soil that was available right there. And then I thought that maybe I can knock them down. So I went there and all day, I, all the evening I was spent the whole night extracting those one gram soil and I could not knock down that stuff. It was coming out. I'm not showing the data. And Richard was at that time, he was assistant prop. I say, can you give me a, he was also working late, so I a, a flexible bed and I went there. I was in the lab all night. I couldn't do it. It means what? That there is a huge amount of potassium in these soils. When you have clay and you have two to one layer of clay like we have, these Philadigan and Drummer and Cisne even, every, when you see clay, it means potassium. Yeah. It's so available that you don't need a bag from KCL and go and buy money and spend money. So expensive now. And I will address that too. So just, so this was the instruction and I couldn't knock it down. No more. Don't need fertilizer. So let me show you I told you that these are just coming from the clay. And when you grow your corn plant in the field, like we have, this we are measuring six inches, what the plant is doing. That nature designed that way, this system. This goes six feet deep. And everybody knows when you go deeper, your clay increases, mostly in these soils. Okay, okay. So, 
See here, here is a six feet and they are taking all this potassium which is available from six feet, not from six inches, but six feet. And the majority of the potassium, every plant put it in their body. They are very intelligent creature. Plant is very smart. And they put it five times more potassium in their body, leaf and stem, before the, fer the, the fertilization and great development formation start. They keep it for a rainy day in case they need it. Soil has nothing to do after that. They are, keep it right there. And when you harvest, what happened? You remove only small portion of the potassium in grain. The remaining goes back. And I will show you how it increased the potassium test level with zero K fertilization. I did this study by weekly sampling for five years on six plots. And you will be saying that somebody is coming at night and putting this fertilization and the test is increasing. Yeah. So let's go and look at this. This is the plow layer. The plow layer contain 250 in six inches, this area. And then if you go non-exchangeable in that six inches, they are 1,000 or even more. And then you have mineral 30,000, which is already going back and feed. It's like a spring. And then if you take profile, six inches deep, the roots, which they are sucking it, they have 3,000 in the profile and the plant have access to profile due to rooting. If you have a good rooting system, like he was talking about bread, he's right. If you have a good rooting system, you have more access to minerals, nutrition. And if you have a good deep soil, you have more. So every soil should be treated according to the soil type. Okay, so now 12,000 here in non-exchangeable, which I show you in the layer, and there are 360,000 in the profile. So, and this is all available. Tell me why you need a bag of potassium. It's like putting a bag in the sea. Sea already have a lot of salt. Why you are putting potassium? If somebody tell you build it pot potassium in the sea. Sea is already potassium and sodium salts. Okay, let's go to the next slide. And then it's recycle. Once it's go there, then water come, microbes come, and they become release all nutrient. But potassium can release just with water from those residues. You take residues, put it in a water, shake it, and then take the water to the lab and it will be all potassium. And if potassium is so soluble that if you take your, your wash it first, your finger, and if somebody determine potassium, put distilled water and put this finger, potassium will come out. Your they will be increased by the, by the photometer, the machine, go up. Because it's, you lose potassium when you have dehydration. If you are going in the sun, what you lose? Not protein, not nitrogen, not potassium. You take frequent sample in the stuff, you will be all, your muscle would be cranking and you will be in trouble, potassium. Anybody who have dry, diarrhea, the first thing they use, potassium. It's so soluble. You don't need anything, it's just water and then you can gain it or lose it. So that is the reason that you have, and what plant remove? Grain remove, if you have two, 200 bushel, they remove just 46 K. Oh. Here. Yeah. 46 potassium K, you remove in 200 bushel. The remaining is returned in the store, which I told you, everything is in the plants, and, and, and stems, and when they dry, they, they go and you plow it in the fall or in the spring, they go back, or with the rain, 260. And you can see it on the check plot, which I'm no, not, I'm removing potassium, but my test level increases. 
Let's see to the next slide. Sometimes the lower plants, this is also true for nitrogen as well as phosphorus and potassium too. When you have a good plant, they start shedding the lower leaf of the plant. And it's become a drain on the plant. And they realize it, that now they don't do good photosynthesis. So they remobilize and send it to the upper level because they have more sunshine and the photosynthesis is active. Sometimes you might get yellowness, but it's due to the old age of the leaf, the lake of sun is shady now. And also uh, some stress of water. There is no worry to be, just go and put fertilizer. No, wasting something. When you have rain, suddenly everything goes, not the lower one, but the old, there is no need of potassium addition. People scared you that let's go and put some potassium. No need. So this is just a natural process of the plant. They are very intelligent. They get the drag. Anybody who's not working in your company, you say, hey, go out, give them pink slap. This is a pink slap for this stuff. Yeah. So now I took some sample. If you see here, these are the potassium fertilizer per year they were given. One was check plot, which I show you my previous slides. These are like zero, 50, 100, 150 in pounds per acre. But now they are sketchy. So increase upon drying. Look at this, the drying. When you take, this is the check plot, this one. I started this and drying it in 25% water. They were in the tray and I was drying in every hour and go to photometer and weigh the samples and see how much the test level is. By removing water, and they also carry the internal from the clay, the layer, just like a sandwich you have, there are, you know, inside spaces. That potassium coming out with every hour when I am testing it. And as I remove water, Nothing happened here, but as I touch five, six percent water, suddenly they come out to the surface. And my test level go up. Look at this. Started with 200, and when I dry it, it's 400. Increase. This is the plant never received fertilizer for the last 16 years. It was a mining operation, but my test is going up. And what you get from the lab, that 400. Actual is here. So it's a deception kind of things. But it's good because this is available. But what the universities and these, they take a fudge factor and remove it. And then they say, hey, I remove this much, this much 40 or 80, and then give you the artificial test level. Testing is completely useless. Yeah. That's why they were not publishing my data. Remember that? And I say, and this is also when you increase the fertilizer, high doses, see here 124 every day, what happens? That the difference is very simple. That means what? Think over it. That means that you collapse the clay. Because clay is just like a nail. When they go up, they collapse it. When you collapse it, there is a less difference between wet and dry. If you want to see yourself that what is my fertilizing program, I'm collapsing my clay, take a sample wet and dry and send it to these labs. What are two samples? If the difference is less, that means you are over fertilizing. Don't tell him, but you can educate yourself. You are over fertilizing because you are collapsing clay. So when you collapse the clay, you are creating a very, very bad environment for roots for water holding capacity, for microbes, for air. That means compaction. And I learned that and I took some courses in mineralogy here in the University of Illinois. But when I started my work as a young chap in bachelor degree, I heard this from a big teacher. They are the farmers like you. He told me that my soil, when I put this fertilizer, my soil is compacted. That was in Pakistan. And I listened, but I didn't know what he's talking about. 
But his experience was telling me that what happened. So you are all working in your field, but you guys are the first observer. Not us. You. And I kept that in mind. So when I came to UFI, when I was pursuing my MS, I took a, a course. One course was there offered in mineralogy, clay mineralogy. And what he told me, exactly science is telling me here. That potassium collapses the clay. You lose cation exchange capacity, which is the most important property of soil. CEC. So when you have CEC, less CEC, that means you retain less nutrient in the soil. And they leach. Calcium is leaching now, magnesium is leaching now because you collapse your clay. Ammonia is now and availability, root penetration. Just by over fertilizing K, you are destroying your soil. And there is interaction between. And I would explain that when I go along and not with my data, because if I was doing a lot, you say, maybe this guy came from somewhere and cooking the data. So I just went and I figured out other studies too from all over the world, I will be showing. That is, there is a difference between wet soil and dry soil. Just in Illinois, I am working on this field, or it's throughout the world. So I went to the literature, and I am very glad to Richard Malvani, who was my professor. He knows how to dig this old literature. I am thankful to him. And he would bring the literature, and I would check it. Uh, my result would be exactly the same as those guys were doing. But the only thing was, I am telling you, they were not telling you, see? I was a black sheep, and still I am. Okay, so this is the soil I took. You see here, here is the hepster. These are different series from Iowa. They were done before me, but they were in the literature, but not educating the farmers, the end user. So this was boy soil 90, when they dry it, 264. See the difference here? Plus, which I explained you that how plant and recycling and the roots, deep root, they are coming to the surface because we are testing six inches. And you should test the whole profile, not six inches. So we are increasing it. This is another series, 94, 170. This is less because there are different clay types and different soil. So everyone increases. This fire guy, the farmer, I think he is really under the influence of agronomist or fertilizer dealer. He is putting so much fertilizer that their difference is less. So he is hosing this, spending his money. And I think this guy would be pretty, from the data I can tell you, this guy would be go for chapter 13 pretty quick. So I am giving you scientifically that be careful. Now. This is Ohio, same here, it increases, here it increases, these guys are Ohio, see here, they are not putting too much, but the increase is there, so that means my data cannot be challenged because I am telling you the other scientist data too. So that was I am telling you, educating you that dry soil always increases as compared to wet soil. When you are drying it, water carry out this potassium out and you measure it. And, and potassium is water soluble. You don't need any microbes for this. Okay, this is another, they are very unstable. This is I did because if it's water soluble and I put these sample in the lab, in the bags, what will happen if moisture changes? Because every season, moisture changes. Rainy season, more humidity, less humidity. But they are inside the lab, and they are there. Look at this. These are different. Uh, those my PhD research, which I show you, 70 to 83, they were applied, then there was no, no, there was application, but not for this. All this was, the eye was taking sample. So I took sample here. January and February, I averaged them in order to increase the sample number. So, 
these were a sampling from February, March, March from all these plots, and these are initial level. And I tested, look at this. And then I store it in the lab, in the bags. And see the difference here? Some are negative, some are, you know, all the negative because when I put the lab, they went back to the clay layer. And the test on the surface decreases. So I am telling you the dynamic nature of this K. It's a sneaky son of a bitch. It just go again. <laughs> you cannot control it, the test. So that means test is useless. Even in the lab, they are changing. It's a good thing for the farmers. But for tester, they would be out of business someday when people know it. So if somebody is poking at these, these <laughs> flags in your field, say, hey, get out, buddy. <laughs> Don't do it. It's not working. Don't spend your money. So this is, and in March, I just tested in one, after one month. See the testing date right here. 90, retested. And there were this much change. And what will happen in the field when it's very dynamic? It's exposed to moisture, microbes, uh, dead animals, everything, you know, and potassium water soluble. So I was used to go the six plot and I would take samples from it bi-weekly. And it was so hard for me, a guy who come from Nevada or Florida and working in Illinois in uh, December and January, that's a dead trap. And one day my professor, now he's died, he told me, why, how you can work in this cold weather? I said, there is a secret I do. <laughs> because he would work with me and he would run to his van. It was start. And I used to put polythene bags in my hair, on the head. So that polythene bags, plastic bags were helping me a lot. They would retain my stuff. So I say, I am from Nevada or Florida. Pakistan is very hot. And you are here in now, you are running from that. <laughs> so I had fun with that. And I was taking these samples. So it was a hard time. So let's go to the field, which I'm going to give you a sample. You will see the tremendous variability up and down on those field samples, in wet as well as in dry. This is a sample I took. And this was done from the check plot, which has never received uh, fertilizer since 70. So there is no disruption. That somebody say, oh, you are putting fertilizer and that's why there is a disruption. No, there was no disruption from outside. And look to these samples. Let me explain it here. This is your wet sample, right fresh. And this is the dry. And every 15 days, they would be jumping. 15 days, they are test level, exchangeable. And then, what will happen that I will go into the summer, which moisture will be low, and uh, there would be a lot of uptake by crops. So they would go down, both. But when I go to December, January, they would go up, because all the residue would put all the fertilizer in the, and there would be, that I explained you before, this plant was putting all the residues, and leaf, and water, rain, snow, so they were, put down that stuff. And in the meantime, this was four years. I was doing every bi-weekly. This was not an easy task. And then in the end, look at this. Wet and dry both are increasing with time. Look at this. So God is giving you the fertility free. And plant is so intelligent, I told you, it's just going up and up. Like somebody's fertilizing, it's in the evening time. Never been fertilized since 70, 16 years mining. But this is increasing. What is helping? The clay itself, they are coming out. And the plant itself. Plant was all putting from the low like a water, like a pump, and putting on the top for you guys. And if after seeing this, and you still go to the fertilizer dealer and say, I need... Now, you know the price of this is so expensive. Now, we were calculating yesterday with Richard, it's $830 per ton. And if you take per pound, it would be almost 70 cents per pound. And if you even put 
say 120, they are recommending two years just for maintenance. And then you are put, putting $100 or whatever, you know, just for nothing. Just putting it at that stuff to his pocket. The same is nitrogen we calculate. You guys are putting 300 for NPK. So you can reduce this kind of stuff and put yourself, you know, put food for your kids and for yourself on the table. So I'm just going whether showing some more data, but they are just wasting your money on the potassium chloride. Okay, next to the next slide here. Now, here we have marrow plots. You were heard guys, marrow plots. This is a scone and soybean rotation for the last 150 years, right? In, in the campus of University of Illinois. Drummers, in a Flanagan soil, but similar like drummer. Look at this. Let me show you, let me, let me show you uh, the, the data. This is a check plot. And this is a plot close by, side by side. And we put this much added because we have all the accounting and the register, what we are doing and what we are removing. We put almost 1,829 in this plot and they are side by sides. And corn is growing, corn and soybean. K removed. This is continuous corn, 1950 to 205 data, I'm saying 50, 51 year data. We added, we removed this much. This yield is less because not due to this, but nitrogen is not also not added in it. It's a mining operation. And here we remove 15 because they get nitrogen, so they suck more potassium and phosphorus. Net change is what? This was this nutmeg change. You add this and now this is the, the stuff headed because the initial, the initial test level was 215 of exchangeable K, six inches. 215, 215, and then they were divided in 1955 when fertilizer era came. So I, we have all the data, their test level, their aided and removal. So when initial was this, but final was the check plot, we removed this much amount. This is very important, I need your attention guys. Check plot, no addition. We are removing corn soybean and this much K was gone. Removing the crops. And the initial was 215 in 1955. But what was the test level in 2005? 362. The same process going on here. And the test level increases by 147 in the check plot. But the other one, 18, that was the added, and we remove K in the grain and residues. And net change was 318. So when you see this, we are, final was 350, lower than that. And then 100 was up because it's going slowly collapsing. Because we are adding and plant, soil don't need it. And this is the data of 50, 51 years. And we have everything like a bank account, this much put and this much in. This is the Maro plate that's still there. And this was established in 1876. So I am reinforcing this again and again from all the data, my data, as well as from the world data. That you guys, I'm changing your mind that, hey, you don't need potassium from the, from the outside. It's already there. Okay, this is another one. This was my research, and look at this. I went there and collected data, just like Maro plot data, from all over the world, from China, Denmark, Germany, India, New Zealand, Poland. Let me go to Germany, and they are the long trials. Now, this was Germany, started in 1914 to 75, and they this much remove in grain and grain and other stuff they were removing. And what happened initial was 141. And the final was 110. It was decreased and it was by minus 31 reduced. But look at this how much we removed. 4046. It's coming from somewhere. 
And I explain it to you from where it's coming from the clay and from the plant itself. It's self-fertilization. This is India. This is also a lot. They remove this much. And remember that, that India take four crops per year. Spring season, then fall season, then summer season, and then you have the winter season. Four crops. And their population is 1 billion and 300 million people. Four crops. And their soil is not like the Midwestern soil. Drummer and very good molly soils. Lake. These people are taking four crops. And they also go after the roots and the residue because they are using it for, for feeding their cows and buffalo. And they are burning it. And this is a disaster, but look at this. Removing all this, and the difference between initial and 60, 79, 62 is just 17 of oh, how much they remove. So K is just so much potassium is there in the soil. So just, just you guys and and this is all the check plot. So you, you can tell it that how much potassium is there and you don't need anything from outside. Now, this is very interesting. There is a plot drummer like a 40 acres and me and my advisor, we went there and we did 250 steps. That's a 40 acre. We every 250 step, we took samples. And then we have the test level, the potassium exchangeable on six inches test level. Oop. Here. And then 250, and then we took the data of the yield. And the yield was from corn soybean rotation. So this was the corn yield on y-axis here. And this is the test level from 183 exchangeable potassium per acre up to 800. And then look at this, that we say, okay, what's the yield relation with the potassium on that spot? So we take some yield, measure the yield on the fixed moisture level on the grain. And look at this, test level changes up and down, up and down, but the yield is right here at 170. And when we do regression statistics, it was saying the potassium say, I have no relation with the yield whatsoever. I have no effect on the yield of this stuff. Because when potassium is limited, then you would have a yield effect. But if it's coming out, oozing out from, uh, then the yield is not affected by potassium. This is the data. I, I took it with my own hand. Yeah. And the critical level, theoretically they establish that put your uh, test exchange at 300 pounds per acre. That's called critical level. It's here. And look to the, they are below the critical level. And the bushel per acre is 160.74. And if it's above this up to 800, it's 160.37. Show me any difference between 800 pounds or 500 pounds. Or show me any yield increase with the high. No, nothing is there. So potassium has no relation with the yield here in North America because it's so much available that you don't need it from the dealer. And I said, let me go and see if anything Guy was saying about the, in Europe. So I have three long-term trials. Rathamstead, that is in England for the last 200, 300 years old. Alfasol. This is bad. I cannot pronounce this a German word. And this is called Germany, uh, Malisol, just like our soils. And then Alfasol forest type of soil, pollen. 
And they also came to the same conclusion, soil K-testing. And I said the fertility, the universal fertility of K-testing. It's not fertility, it's fertility. And look at this, the K availability indexes did not effectively predict K uptake. Whatever you are measuring, it cannot tell you that how much crop is taken. It has no relation. You are just shaking the soil and that's it. And paying for it. This study began to into question the usefulness of the methods that attempt to determine K. Please use the microphone, guys, in the back. Okay. Okay, sorry. So now in 19, Blake et al., he told that, hey, there is no relation. We did it in Germany, we did it in England, we did it in Poland. No relationship. It's not a poor guy in Illinois. All these guys are saying it. Even then, they were not ready to publish the data. Okay, now let's go back to India. There was a long experiment. They did it for 8,800 8, trials in India. And the time was 72 to 90, 94 with rice and wheat, a different soil type. So what they found, this is a civilization, India, which is there for seven, 800,000 years. And their practices are not favorable to the soil maintenance, you know. They are against erosion, everything taken, don't give anything back. Yeah, and even then, look at this. There is these eight, close to 9,000 9, trials actually. And what they did? They say K responses were rare and did not exceed 30 pounds K per acre. And how much we are putting here in North America, which is the most productive soil in the world. And all these immigrants 200 years back are 300, not even 300 in the Midwest. And we are all just shaking all over that if you don't put that bag, we are doomed. <laughs> you are so psychologically being, you know, timid. Look to India, right here. And yield was depressed in several trials, and I have seen it too. You are losing money with your own application. Then soil test alone is not sufficient. The conclusion was that again, to predict the response or the dose of potassium fertilizer to be applied, Goswami 1976. Let's go next. Now let's go a little bit calculation, sharpen my pencil and we calculated that what happened if you are not applying fertilizer in the Midwest scenario, especially Illinois, Iowa and these. So corn remove 0.323 pounds K per bushel. If you have 200 bushel times that, so you will be removing 200 K in 46, 46 46 pounds in 200 bushel for yield grain. That's what we remove. Journal is average if you have 200 bushel yield. So a typical Illinois soil contains 3,000, which I show you right my first dynamic slide. 3,000 pounds per acre in a plow layer when you go deeper six feet. The roots are eating from that plate from six feet. And then 360 pounds in the profile. Three, three is a 360,000 in profile. Enough K in the plow layer for 650 years. If you are just exploiting and not putting any fertilizer, there would be till taking out potassium from the soil to the plant for 650 years. But that's not the case. You will be having 8,000 year supply in the profile because we are dealing with the six feet of profile here in this part of the world. So that means in a biblical term, you will surpass Jesus twice. He was 3,000 years back, and then Ibrahim and all these, Noah, you will surpass the biblical age of that. This is the 8,000 years, which is not the history of known history. There's no known history. 
there's so much potassium there every year you can remove 200 bushels without adding anything okay this is marrow plot again the area of the marrow plot which is right here and Richard and me go there and we observe this is the check plot for the last 150 years without addition of NPK. We have firing here, but this is from nitrogen. This is no potassium sign that this is deficient in potassium. And we go there and check it. The marrow plot, the check plot. And still it's not showing any K sign. This is all nitrogen. And how much we remove? 4,200. Residue. Yeah. This has been continuous for 150 years? Yeah, 150 years without any fertilization, yes. NPK. And the K is a special science for when they are deficient. They are browning and they have special not nitrogen or sulfur. And then no deficiency is obvious, but there is no sign of K deficiency. That always we observe it and we record it. Now, this was a pamphlet which I am thankful to Richard. He took it out. They were lying way below the piles because they were not showing it in the library of University of Illinois. And what there was people, they knew it already. Potassium can be little rapid as needed from the inexhaustible supply naturally contained in the normal soil of Illinois. This was Hopkin, that was the first dean of University of Illinois in 1915. They were known, but they were not showing as they were pressurizing me and Richard that don't publish it, but we publish it. And this is the pamphlet, right? Today it's there. Now, who originated soil testing? This was the guy, he was pure chemist, and he did it in 1944. He was not agronomist, he was not soil scientist, he was soil chemist. He, what he did, he put trials in, in the state of Illinois, and he related the exchangeable K to, available, to, to the, on this side, increase in yield, this is the test level of exchangeable K. What he found are scattered, and he was honest enough to say that the dots show a journal, but no means close relationship between the exchangeable test and the yield. And the data is here. But I don't know how they change this recommendation. If you take a granny handbook, which are with the dealership and with all people, farmers of this state. I don't see this, but they published and they came with a very different figure. Very nice and pound per pound, uh, this uh, increase and decrease, and very nice like somebody's smoking cigar and eating donuts and have a coffee in, the, in, the, in his office. This is not what we found in the field and in the world. No relationship. So you are using this. Currently, this is the recommendation system. Impose on you guys. And they calculate all the pound per pound response for different crops and a very good relation and said, you will go way up to this. And there is no zero start from 50. I don't know how they come. It's all hodgepodge. So, and this is the handbook. People call it, they call it buddy. The, and I call it, they would put you in a big accident. <laughs> it's not your buddy. It's destroying you. I would say don't buy it because this sale, what it did, it's increased the use, the sale of fertilizer so much for the last, I, we calculated that and let me show you that too. 
Okay, this, this came 75, these recommendations, which are using me nowadays from the University of Illinois, and not just university, but Iowa, Indiana, Ohio, all Midwest. This is the recommendation they are doing it. So no regard to care response. They don't care about response. Well, who care for response? They say, based on the build-up maintenance concept, and you guys know what build-up and what is. Build-up means put fertilizer, they'd go up to 300, and what you remove, calculate how much you remove, put it that back too. So that's the, and they are saying four port would be e very easy K2O to increase one K level. That is also hogwash because oh, every soil is different. S the sand, sandy will go very quick and s uh, clay would go very difficultly to increase it. So regardless of soil type and also CC mineralogy, they don't care. They just put fertilizer and maintenance for crop removal. What you remove, put it back without regard to side type and case supply. But these are the basis of recommendation which are absolutely wrong scientifically. Okay, so what next? This is the consequences of this recommendation. This is 1940 to 10, we have to update it. But look at this, this is the crop removal. As crop increases due to varieties, hybrid, new practices, so they need more potassium. So their removal is increasing with yield. But look to the fertilizer, we got not a pound of increase from potassium. What we got the increase is the potassium is way above that from fertilizer. They even don't regard the supply of the soil. There's the sale now going on. So let's see how much we are paying for it. In Illinois, fertilizer K imports have far exceeded crop K removal. 66 tons per year on average for 40 years and, and a current cost of 110 million per year we are paying. And But the real cost is closer to 1 billion per year because even this is free and this, this is free what we are putting. This is the extra we calculated. If you don't put even then your yield would be the same. So this is all going on, not science, but sale. Now, the bad news continue, I'm sorry to say that, but we survey more than 2,100 response trial for KCL, not potassium sulfate or other fertilizer, just KCL because that's a commercial fertilizer they are giving to the farmers. And what we found out of 2,100, we found 796 were cash grain production in North America. There were other corn or wheat or barley or grain production, and they were applying. 4% show significant increase, but 96 did not. They never budge, not a one bushel per, per from acre increases for grain. And these are all published data. Now you can go, we have references, you can see it. Yield increase mainly occur with sandy soil, if you have very sand, sandy soil, so there is, there, there is a need for it. Or you have very compacted soil, that root cannot go, then you need potassium, because it is very important. And also, compacted shallow soil, very shallow. Like I will show you like this, uh, 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 soil type which are very compacted. Richard, what's the name of the soil? I forgot. Compacted soil like uh, my father-in-law is having? Huh? Swiger, yes. Swiger, my father-in-law is also one of the problems he was facing. I will come later on and explain what I did. Compacted soil needs some fertilizer too. You have to remove compacted I drainage or you deep chill chisel and take out compaction. Otherwise, you have to put something if you're compacted because root have no access to the potassium. So, otherwise, if you have 797 grain, only 4% show response on these. Otherwise, it's like a surgeon 
somewhere in here or in, in Springfield, and he is a heart surgeon. I'm just showing you another way to interpret the data. And you have 796 patients go there with a heart problem, and he's a surgeon, he operated on him. And he come to that hospital right in the front door and say, folks, I have this much patient came and I operated them. Only four went back to their houses. The remainings are odd underground. Would you go to that doctor? I would run away from that place. That's what's going on with your K, fertility and fertilizer usefulness. Okay. Remind me because I just <laughs> forget. Okay, so this is another one. Now that was all about soil testing and the no yield increase. But there is a hidden cost still there. And that cost is, look at this, this is done right on the campus of University of Illinois. So I mean yield under no till and strip till, see here. 709, that was done, and these are different types. Yield increase has been reported with soybean, corn, potato, cotton. In this example, no till soybean yield was significantly decreased by deep bending KCO. Look at this, everybody goes, and these are the dosage increases. Potassium is very hot. They can destroy your seed if you bend closer. And also, chloride and potassium itself has do a lot of damage to your crops too. Let's go to the next. This was experiment done by a very good scientist. I really like him. What he took, petri dishes and put microbes. And they were nitrogen fixing legumes. Isobacter or whatever, you know, the microbes were. And he, what he was doing in the lab, that he was changing the percentage of calcium and potassium in these petri dishes and put those micro microbes to see the number that they are increasing or decreasing when he is changing the potassium and the calcium ratio. And see here, here these are bacteria types and he has zero calcium, here is without calcium they are here, their population. As he increased calcium more and reduced potassium, his jump. Calcium is very good for the rhizobium, not potassium. Look at this. When he become 40, 60, it went here. When he become 50, 20, potassium and 50, calcium, it went up. As he increasing calcium and reducing potassium, the population goes going up. That means what? If it's the rhizobium, they would be fixing more nitrogen for soybean, for other stuff, these bacteria. Calcium is so important. And why? Because calcium improves the structure of the soil. More spaces, more water holding capacity, more, more root penetrations, more roots go down. Calcium is a wonderful, if I have the power and I can convince you guys, put more lime as compared to potassium. Potassium, decrease your potassium gradually and put one tons limes or two tons, whatever you afford, a good quarry, just calcium carbonate, not magnesium, just calcium carbonate. You will be benefited tremendously. And I will show you later on, which I did with my own father-in-law. I will show you on a very compacted soil. So that's, that's what I was showing you. Now this is another one, chloride legume yield decrease. Chloride is very toxic for microbes. And look at the data. It suppresses uptake of nitrate and also magnesium. And why? Because if you put chloride, it's compete with nitrate. You are putting nitrogen fertilizer, the more expensive one. And then you also put potassium chloride, what happened that there is a com tremendous competition with nitrate and chloride. They compete. And who wins? Chloride. It's faster, go to the 
to the storage and occupy the, the spaces over there in the leaf, in the, in the, where there is grain production. So you put $200 per acre of anhydrous. And when it's become a change from ammonia to nitrate and plant up, take it, the food is ready to take it on your table and somebody take it by force. That's chloride, what chloride is doing. And what happened, both are negative. Chloride go up quick and nitrate leads down. There it go to the Mississippi River. So that's exactly what you are doing. It's called a double barrel fire on your feet. You buy expensive, the more expensive nutrient is nitrogen. When it's become nitrate, you also put chloride with it. Eat food and then take some dairy and <laughs> medicine. Why? It's leech. Go away. You have no excess. Your efficiency is gone. So that was, that's the data right here. Look at this, how it's coming down with chloride. Magnesium down, MNE is down, nitrogen down. Nitrogen is the most affected. This is N. Look at this. As you increase your K rates, there we go. Now, this is another one. It's not just legumes, but all they are competing suppressed nitrate chloride. That's the more bad fertilizer you can use for crops. And nitrate is gone, chloride interfere with carbohydrate production. When you introduce it, it cannot go, plant cannot make carbohydrate, it's toxic. And you have, especially for citrus and tobacco, they completely take out the quality. And amazingly, they call potassium is a quality element. No, it's not. We survey 1,400 trials, and there is no benefit. Some you get, get, but if the soil is a problem. Otherwise, not. Now, if you're still under the influence of your fertilizer dealer, be prepared for this bad news too. Lower crop quality, which I told you. Calcium and magnesium deficiency in forage grasses, that is always when anybody who is raising animals, if you put a lot of potassium loaded legumes or grains or anything, they are suffering from either calcium, magnesium. It's called calcium decreases, your animals are suffering from milk fever. And magnesium, they paralyze, they cannot walk. Their muscles are not working. So you, you suppress the uptake of calcium, magnesium in the, league, the food, whatever you feed them. And they also affect your milk. You are using that milk later on. So you are also taking lex magnesium lex in the, because you are doing it. It's affect the nutritive value of the product for animal as well as for human beings too. Because garbage in, garbage out. There is no other stuff. It will affect definitely that stuff. Okay, juices are affected too. And especially potato, you are t telling these chips. And if you put a lot of potassium and chloride, potassium suppress yield is bigger, but they are fluffy. They have more spore spaces. Gravity is low. They are not heavy. So they're like a sponge. So when they make chips or french fries, they have spaces. So you get a lot of oil in that stuff. So what that mean? Obesity, you are sucking oil now. Because potassium change the quality of the potato. Chips or french fries, whatever that stuff is. So you are sucking a lot of, and that's a, that's a problem. That's due to potassium. Okay, this is the mud wall I told you I had a teacher, which I learned from him. I was doing fertilizer trial way back in 70s, when I was just young chip and they have bachelor and do fertilizer trial. So I did some trial and put fertilizer, I was naive, put potassium chloride on farmer field. So I was coming, there was an old guy sitting on a wall 
and he was mixing the same bag which I gave to other farmer to put it there and he was mixing this and what along the wheat straw both together and he was making this mud wall see and I say what are why you are putting this potassium he say you know this is this was a farmer never been to school he told me that when I do this then I don't have to do maintenance due to rain it's just nicely solid compact no cracks are coming like you did in the dry season and with rain so I am not doing it I say how you learned it he say I was in second world war working in England because Pakistan and India was just like United States there was occupied by UK at that time they were the masters so when they say they took me over there and they were making Germany attack so we didn't have air airport and any preparation so on the east side of the England we were putting potassium chloride on that railroad and they would make it compacted because it compact the soil and they would put this casial and put it there and then you know make it and our plane would come and land on this we didn't have time for cement and all these different scientifically things we were using KCL to make the road. So now what we are doing with our soil? Same thing which did. So that was I'm showing you. This was the guy. And why? So when I came here and I took courses for PhD level in soil mineralogy, that guy was absolutely right. And for that, my teacher, which I learned from farmer, I took these courses for it, just to understand it, why I'm not. So I took mineralogy courses, and that's exactly what was showing with x-ray. As you put a clay, which is more flexible, and they have more space in between, and they have more for roots penetration and for water, they were collapsing with time. And they were last water holding capacity, it was compacted, roots were hard to go inside for nutrients, and that's exactly what that farmer told me from this wall. So when I come to any meeting, I listen to the farmers too, yeah, because they are the great teacher. They have experience. So you guys are valuable and I love to address and discuss with you. Okay, next. What is the best option to increase profitability? Forget about soil testing, which I told you again and again. Don't worry about K fertilization in a grain crops. If they are not compacted, or they are not sandy, or they are not other problem. So don't worry. And I show you data for 100 years, for 50 years. Then unless the soil has compacted sandy, conduct your own strip trial. When you go there and farmer knows which Soil, soil area is good and bad because they, are, they have the fuss and knowledge. Just put a small strips and put 30 pounds, not more than that, a potassium chloride on one few plants, 28, 29, and put some stone that you can get and harvest them, their yield, and without, just little strip without. And then in the end, when they are at 14 or 15, whatever master for both, weigh it if you get any benefit so be foot there but you won't get do your own step try take the power in your hand good soil other soil they have always variability and compare them side by side just simple select the plants don't apply kcl and then if you can afford and still you are afraid, check it and slowly decrease your potassium if you are afraid. But take the charge. Okay. Now, you only apply 30 to 40 pounds per acre. If possible, use K2SO4 instead of KCL. Because when you introduce KCO4 expenses, but low amount, 20, 30, not much. The reason is sulfate never compete with nitrate. Sulfate also take care of the sulfur a little bit, but potassium would not do anything. Don't say that potassium, potassium is good. It's sulfate not color, and, and, and not potassium. Potassium, I told you, suppress calcium, magnesium, compaction. It's sulfate. Remove that in, injurious stuff from it. 
Just do your own research with time. Now, this is my father, Len. I, my wife is Caucasian, and we met in University of Illinois, and we married in 93. And when, whenever I go to my father-in-law, his field, he's in Streeter, close to Streeter, and his soil is Swiger. They are very compacted soil, a lot of clay, and they have two feet depth, that's it. One and a half, two feet. So since I have that knowledge, he told me how you can help me. He was whining. Always I would sit like everybody do here. It's a culture on the cup of coffee and donuts in the kitchen. And he would start, he would start whining. And I say, I should help them. I did not want to because you never do things with your father-in-law. If you do a little bit mistake, you will be in a dark house. So I did not want to do it. But anyway, I did it to help him. I said, okay, let's do something together. If you lose money, I will pay. Let's do it. Because farmers are hard to crack. They have their, they have their own religion. They don't listen. <laughs> anyway, I went there and I did not start working with him. Now, let me show you what I did. I took two pounds. I said, now you put two tons per acre from close by a very nice quarry on the close to Pontiac. And I would put $20 at that time or per ton or whatever they would spray it here. So he would put 40 or 30, I don't remember the amount, but so what I did, I said, don't follow the University of Illinois recommendation, corn, soybean, corn, soybean, that your soil is not for continuous corn or corn, soybean, because corn is a good crop if you are on a deep soil or you have any maneuver access. Our deep soil like Muscatoon, Flanagan, Drummer, and you have a lot of maneuver and you can put it there, then corn is, corn is, corn is a sucker. It eat everything. So I said, don't do it. So I said, let's do side by side. So this was a 30 acre and 30 acre plot on this side, this side. Let me explain now what we found. This is the agronomy recommendation in the University of Illinois, Iowa, those recommendations, corn, soybean, uncompacted soil, and put potassium chloride and all these different things, fall application. And this is, I changed it. I completely stopped corn for two years and put a lot of lime, two tons, two tons, to open up the soil and chisel it. So now the child, I throw out compaction. And if you look where cal I put calcium, that was so nice, open and like a, like a butter. Roots can go and everything when I dig the soil after three, four years. And I put do a very good variety of soybean. So he put the soybean, so this is the third year now. And we remove the, the amount of carbon because carbon suck nitrogen from the plant. If carbon is there and heterotrophs are there and they need nitrogen, plants have no chance, chance because these are the kings of the jungles. They can eat the nitrogen carbon. Carbon is very powerful, more powerful than the plant. They compete. You put a little bit of carbon residue to the crops, they would be yellow, never get green. So anyway, if you see that their stuff is still green and they have more still doing photosynthesis, putting the grain filling period still on. This guy is yellow. You can see all the yellow residue from the previous crops. And when we tested it, this guy got 50, 55, 60 in three years. So I have been. So I have been. Thank you. And this guy, that 25, 30, not much. So, and this did a good next year when on the third year I want to break the rotation, that disease should not come. So I told him, got a good variety of corn now. And the Zweger, which PI is just 110 on the university book. PI for Zweger is 120, 100, very poor soil. If you go more poor, go on 55, on 80. And if there is a Joliet, that is more poor than that. That's the only. 
Romeo Judet is 70 bushel, 5 bushel. It's good for just construction, not for. So he opened the soil with calcium, with chiseling. He put a lot of calcium, two tons, and still he's doing because now he's addicted. And he would see 50 and 60 bushel. And what happened next year when he put this? I say put corn and look at this. This is not muscatine, this is not drummer, this is a poor, and with management you change it, which we, I was working with him. This is my corn next year, after three years soybean. Soybean put all the residue which was nitrogen, full of nitrogen, and you cannot take all the soybean grains, they were also putting their 10%, 5%, whatever the amount was. And all the carbon was gone, potassium was gone, and he got 230, 210 on the Swager, which PI was just 110 and one, this is officially. And now he's, his bins are now bigger. He's happy, he's not whining. And I'm not living in a dog house anymore. Any question you guys have, let me entertain it. Thank you very much for your patience.